Okay, sounds good. Good afternoon. I'm Jessica Dumas. I'm chairperson for the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce and president of Jessica Dumas Coaching and Training. I'd like to acknowledge that this message is coming to you today from Treaty One Territory, home of the Ojibwe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota and Dene Nations and homeland of the Red River Métis. Thank you very much for joining us today from the comfort of your own home or your social distance location. We're very pleased to host this discussion today with our very special guests. We have over 300 individuals that are registered for today's event. And that helps us recognize how appreciative our local community is of the Canadian Chamber, as well as our community's desire to share their experience with our National Chamber. The Canadian Chamber has been a leader among leaders at the national level, voicing members' concerns and advocating the innovative approaches to our federal government on managing through crisis and coming out in the best position possible for recovery. As chair of a large urban chamber, I'd like to share our appreciation for the Canadian Chamber and the leadership of Honourable Perrin Beattie, as well as Trevor Stratton, who will also be joining us today. Under the Canadian Chamber, our national network has come together like never before. And like never before, the power of the network has been demonstrated as the force that it really is. Perrin and Trevin, on behalf of the Winnipeg Chamber and our event partner, the Manitoba Chambers of Commerce, Please accept our deep appreciation and thank you for joining us today and for all that you have done and continue to do to support our business and our community and, and our country. History will show that this very well may be the chamber's, uh, chamber's finest hour. Thank you to the Manitoba Chamber of Commerce for partnering with the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce on this event. We appreciate this partnership that has really been a, a shining light since uh, in the chamber movement since this whole shift began. It's quite encouraging to see the three levels of the chamber movement, municipal, provincial and national, working so closely together around our one and only goal, which is supporting our businesses. So thank you for each of you for joining us today and I'm pleased to hand it over to Chuck Davidson, President and CEO of the Manitoba Chamber of Commerce to introduce more formally our panelists today. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica, for those tremendous uh, introductory remarks. I think it's uh, it's uh, very telling again about the relationship and the power of the of the chamber network that uh, exists in Canada. That we've got the Winnipeg, the Manitoba, and the Canadian Chamber of Commerce uh, all taking part in this very important call uh, today. Again, uh, thank you again to Perrin and for Trevin for taking part, and thank you to the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce for partnering with the Manitoba Chamber of Commerce. Uh, just to kind of give our, our listeners and our viewers a sense as to how this is going to work. Uh, we're going to allow for some opening comments at the beginning. There is a Q&A portion of this as well that we will have some questions and answers because we know that uh, as business members throughout the province, you have a variety of questions on, on issues that are being dealt with as we deal with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and so we'll get to those. So you simply need to just go to the Q&A section at the bottom of the Zoom call here type in your questions and we will get to those as, as quickly as possible. Uh, in addition, uh, Lauren Remillard, the President and CEO of the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce and myself have a, a list of uh, questions that we will also fire away at Perrin and Trevin throughout, uh, throughout this call as well. So we're gonna go for about an hour. We've got about 130 people on the line, so which is terrific. Uh, we'll start with some opening comments and I, I, I'll just do a quick introduction. I know there's a extremely lengthy bio, but I think most people know uh, the president and CEO of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce has been a true leader uh, in the Chamber network for, for more than a decade. Uh, Perrin Beatty, the Honorable Perrin Beatty, and Trevin Stratton, who is the uh, Vice President of Policy as well as the Chief Economist, uh, and was recently in Manitoba, in fact, one of our uh, most recent speakers. He spoke to the membership of the Manitoba Chamber of Commerce in February about uh, the economy. I think all the things that we talked about in the economy that you were looking forward to at that time, I think those are kind of out the window now, unfortunately, though, Trevin. I think some things have developed as a result of that. So uh, we'll look for a bit of an update in, in your comments. But uh, as for some opening marks, uh, let Perrin Beattie, the Honorable Perrin Beattie, if we could uh, pass the microphone to you. Great. Chuck, thank you very much. And Lauren, thank you very much for your hospitality today. But let me pick up, first of all, where Jessica started off. Uh, this is an opportunity for us at all levels, municipal, provincial, federal, to be working together on an issue of critical importance to all Canadians. And the strength of the Canadian Chamber comes from our network. It is the 450 Chambers of Commerce and Boards of Trade across the country that represent some 200,000 businesses of all sizes, every sector, every region of the country, 
that gives us our, our force. And in Manitoba, it is you folks who are our eyes and ears on the ground and who help to make sure that we're aware of what the needs are and can, can serve uh, all of our members more effectively. This is for, for all of us online and for all Canadians an extremely trying time. Uh, none of us could have anticipated even six weeks ago where we would be today. Trevin will talk to you in a few minutes about a, the most major survey that's being done of business conditions since the uh, outbreak of COVID-19 in Canada. And uh, it will show something about the force of what we've been hit with by the tsunami. Um, but it's abundantly clear that, that what we're seeing is completely reshaping the nature of Canadian business and the Canadian economy. Uh, I, it's probably appropriate to start with a word of congratulations to Manitoba. Your record in managing this pandemic has been really remarkable. And uh, it really sets a benchmark for the rest of the country to, to look at. But just because you've been successful in terms of managing the, the health aspects, and I've done an extraordinary job there, doesn't mean that, that Manitoba businesses aren't feeling a dramatic impact as a result of the measures that have had to be taken to be able to protect the public health. And one of the things we want to be able to address today is, is what can be done to assist and where do we go from here. From the Canadian Chamber's perspective, we look at it in essentially three areas. The first is we're focused on the immediate impacts of the pandemic and how we, how we manage that. Uh, what can we do working with governments at all levels to, and, and with other stakeholders to try to ensure that business can successfully weather the storm? The second is that, that we're giving attention now to what are the conditions under which we can begin to reopen? Uh, it's abundantly clear that we can't remain on and, and should not re remain on lockdown indefinitely. Uh, public health comes first, and it must do so. Public confidence is absolutely critical. People have to know that when we do reopen, that the health of our employees, of our customers, and of the general public is the paramount concern of, of everybody. But it is critical for us now to be planning to say, what are the conditions that we're looking for at the time that we, that we believe that we can begin to decontrol? And what is it that businesses should be doing and other organizations to put measures in place to protect our employees and our, our customers and the general public. If we have those plans in place and if there's clarity, then this will allow us to reopen more rapidly. And, and that's absolutely critical. And it means then that we need to work together to do that. Then the third area that we're looking at is uh, what should the public policy agenda be afterward? How has the nature of this pandemic affected our global trading system? How has it affected the nature of our business organizations in Canada? What has it done to public finances? For example, today we heard from the parliamentary budget officer who said at the federal level that we may be looking this year of a, at a federal deficit of up to a quarter of a trillion dollars. This is in addition to the, to the accumulated debt that we have run up over the course of a century and a half. Now, this means that, that even as we start to come out of this and, and as we start to decontrol, we're going to come out with a very serious fiscal headache as well. And governments at all levels are going to have to be looking at how has their agenda changed? It won't be, we won't be where we were at the beginning of the year. And it's going to be important for governments at all levels to focus on the must haves as opposed to the nice to haves. We need to focus on how do we, uh, on how we restore growth to the Canadian economy. We need to focus on investment. We need to focus on entrepreneurship. And government has to position itself to facilitate, to uh, innovate, to encourage, as opposed to simply regulating and, uh, and, and holding business back or taxing. Uh, so we need a fresh public policy agenda. And it's important that the chamber movement and the business community be at the table as that agenda is being developed at all levels of government. So Chuck, let me stop there and, and turn it over to, uh, to Trevin, and then I'd very much welcome hearing from, from those who are online and be delighted to answer any questions anyone may have. Thank you, Perrin. And uh, with that, we will turn it over to Trevin, who is the Chief Economist and the Vice President of Policy for the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. Trevin? Yeah, thanks, Chuck. And uh, first of all, I mean, th thanks to you and, and thanks to Lauren for, for the invitation to, to speak. Um, 
you know, Chuck, you really just helped uh, put things in perspective for me. I, I, it feels like years ago when I was in Manitoba, I guess it was just February, um, now, now that I think about it. Um, you know, on that note, you mentioned that, that a lot of things have changed and, and Perrin mentioned as well that um, yesterday we just released um, some of the most comprehensive data on, uh, on what businesses are currently experiencing uh, during the crisis. Uh, and so what I wanted to do is uh, maybe take you through a, a few of the high level findings of that uh, nationally, uh, and also maybe dig down into, into Manitoba as well, particularly um, to give you a bit of the, the lay of the land. Um, and so what we did uh, in the survey that, that we had that came out yesterday, um, it's really a comprehensive view into how businesses are adapting, managing, um, or sometimes sadly failing as the COVID-19 shutdown continues. Um, so we received insights from, uh, from more than 13,000 businesses across the country um, to bring into focus the time pressure that businesses are facing uh, to avoid closing their doors permanently. Um, at the same time, the survey also shows how quickly some of the businesses are adapting to social distancing and preparing uh, for the reopening of the economy. Um, and this information that we've gathered is going to be critical for, for government and also for business leaders as, as they develop their programs and plans going forward. Um, I'm sure many of you probably might have seen it in the media yesterday, um, but, but really one of the big, the big headline findings is that over half of all businesses in Canada um, have seen a decline of 20% or more in revenue um, from, from the same quarter last year, from Q1 in 2020 uh, since Q1 in 2019. Um, half of businesses have seen a 20% decline in revenue. Um, even within that, uh, about one third of businesses are reporting a 40% decline in revenue uh, during that same period. Um, these numbers are obviously sobering, um, but, but not surprising considering you know, what we're seeing anecdotally um, or we have been over the past months. Um, and now we have data to prove it. Uh, when we asked businesses how much of a cash buffer they had going into the crisis, um, about 40%, 42% uh, said that they couldn't operate longer than 60 days without a source of revenue. Um, about 51%, so half of businesses said they couldn't operate longer than 90 days without a source of revenue. Um, we're about one and a half months into this right now, um, which certainly demonstrates that, that the threshold um, for businesses running out of time uh, is coming up in, in the coming weeks. Um, similarly, when we asked businesses about um, the demand for their products and services, uh, over 80% of businesses said that they have experienced a medium or high drop in demand um, since the crisis, um, and about two-thirds of businesses said that it was a high drop in demand itself, um, which is certainly concerning when we're looking at the numbers too. Um, we also asked businesses um, whether they can remain uh, partially or fully open amid social, social distancing measures, how long could it be? Um, about 17% said that they couldn't remain open amid any time of social distancing. Um, and certainly we've seen a number of businesses close over the past few weeks. Um, another 22% said that they couldn't be open for longer than three months uh, amid social distancing. And once again, we're, we're halfway through that. And so, um, you know, these, these next little, this next little while, but also the, the programs that are in, in place, if they can be improved, um, if we get the money out quick enough, um, this is going to be crucial for, for business survival going forward. Uh, and then, you know, finally, we, we also saw um, a number of businesses laying off staff, uh, about 40% of laid off staff, another 40% have reduced staffed hours or shifts. Um, and so this certainly speaks to some of the numbers or, or some of the uh, unemployment numbers we saw coming out of March with, with over a million Canadians, um, you know, being unemployed. I did mention that there are um, some select findings that demonstrate Canadian business resiliency as well. Um, about 45% are using new methods to interact with customers, 45% are testing working from home, uh, about 12% are testing out e-commerce, uh, a number of businesses are uh, altering products and services, about 35% of them, um, and another 20% of them are, are altering methods of production as well. Um, and so um, if there is a silver lining in all of this, um, it is certainly that uh, in the face of many challenges, you know, businesses have proven to be, businesses that can at least, have proven to be agile, much more agile than many governments that we've seen during this period, um, and actually uh, adapting to new conditions. If we look at Manitoba specifically, um, maybe the other silver lining, at least for this province, um, is that Manitoba, um, in terms of the economic impact, has performed amongst the best uh, amongst provinces uh, during the period. 
Um, if we look at, uh, you know, we, we asked a number of questions about disruptions to business uh, during the crisis. Um, and Manitoba, you know, in most of the indicators that we looked at has some of the, the fewest amount of disruptions. Um, if we look at decrease in demand for products or services, uh, Manitoba has the, the lowest amount of decrease in demand. Um, if we look at disruptions experienced by suppliers, uh, Manitoba is, is the second lowest. Um, businesses that are unable to move or ship goods due to disrupt supply chains, uh, Manitoba is the third lowest. Um, cancellation of services offered by business, Manitoba is also the lowest. Um, it, it goes on and on for, for quite a bit. Um, also, a number of Manitoba businesses are, are proving very adept at, at altering um, products and services. Um, they're amongst the highest for businesses reporting that, that they've altered services, um, amongst the highest reporting that they've added new ways to interact with customers, um, amongst the highest uh, reporting that they're, they're experimenting with e-commerce. Uh, and so, uh, you know, Manitoba businesses, you know, the, the negative economic impact of this is broad based across regions and across sectors, and it's not good for anyone. Um, but at least the, the impact um, is, is the least or, or at least amongst the least for, for your province right now. Um, and the businesses that are experiencing it are, are proving to be very agile as well right now, too. Um, if we look at the amount of businesses that said that they had to uh, lay off almost all of their workforce, 90% or 100% of their workforce, uh, Manitoba businesses are reporting the lowest amount of businesses that have had to, to lay off a, a huge amount of their workforce as well. Um, and so uh, looking forward, obviously, there, there are um, a number of issues that we're looking at as well. Um, we're certainly not out of this yet. Perrin um, has made a point of uh, stressing uh, that this is just the, the leading edge um, of the numbers that we're seeing. Uh, the worst is probably most economists are projecting in Q2 in the second quarter of this year. Bank of Canada is looking at something like a 15 to 30% decline in GDP over the next quarter. Um, but most projections, and I'll mention this is entirely uncertain depending on what rules are put in place and depending on how individuals and businesses react, um, but are hopefully looking for not a rebound, but for things to get better in Q3 and beyond. Um, and so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay, well, Chuck, I'll just jump in uh, with my first question then. Uh, I will say this, just uh, thank you very much, Perrin and, and Trevin. Uh, with respect to the data, I know a few people have, have noted the data is of great interest. I would encourage all those participating in the call today to please go to the Canadian Business Resilience Network, cbrn.ca. The data is going to be there. Um, the data is being released in the Winnipeg Chamber newsletter that went out today. And I know, Chuck, you're distributing that to your members as well. So uh, some great findings in there. Please make sure you're consulting your chamber communications. Uh, my first question, though, is for Perrin. Uh, as noted, the Canadian Chamber... Uh, has been the leading voice in Ottawa advocating for business and has helped encourage the federal government to make some of the critical changes to some of the programs that uh, have been announced. Can you talk a little bit about that work and the conversations that you're having with federal officials, in particular the Prime Minister? Uh, how has your experience as a former, former cabinet minister in Ottawa shaped your approach to government relations during this unprecedented crisis? Lauren, the, fr the first thing certainly I learned from the time that I was in government is that it's important when you go with government to go with solutions as opposed to simply problems. And in this instance, um, so very often business finds itself at loggerheads with government and we're uh, trying to persuade them not to do something they were planning or to do something they weren't planning to do. In this instance, we're all in it together. We have a common enemy here. There's a disease that is, that is uh, ravaging our economy and, and the health of our, of our population as well. And we all are on the same side. Similarly, business and labor are on the same side in this. Uh, we maintain good relationships with our counterparts in labor. And, and I count, uh, for example, Hassan Yosef from the Canadian Labor Congress as a, as a friend. We'll often diverge or disagree in terms of how we should be dealing with issues. But when we look at this, our goal is the same, and it, that is to protect the health of Canadians and of Canadian workers and to ensure the, the health of our economy. And uh, it makes sense for us to work together. What I've seen so far in this is that, is that governments have been very open. There's been more outreach by the prime minister and by cabinet ministers to me personally in the last six weeks than there was in the previous four years. Uh, so there's a real desire on the part of, of government to, to, to consult, 
to communicate and to, to bring people in. And as a consequence, it's made it possible for us to, to have input at early stages as government has been designing programs. One of the things they're clearly looking at is what's happening on the ground. And the uniqueness of the, of the chamber network, the 450 chambers and boards of trade across the country representing 200,000 businesses, is that it's truly Main Street Canada. And I hear from, from uh, you folks and from your colleagues in, in Manitoba and across the country immediately when there are impacts of, of changes in the economy or changes in government programs. And in this instance, then, it means that the chamber is uniquely qualified to be able to act as the voice of, of business to governments at all, at all levels and working together. The other thing that we've done is uh, it's exactly the same in Winnipeg or in Manitoba as it, at the, as it is at the federal level. Uh, part of the uniqueness of the, of the Chamber of Commerce is the power to convene, to bring together a lot, of a lot of voices, often very disparate voices, around one table and uh, to look for solutions. So one of the first things that we did was to say, in addition to our own network, how do we reach out to others? Uh, Labor is an example, but, but also other business organizations. So we created the Canadian Business Resilience Network, which has the 450 chambers and boards of trade of, the, of our chamber network, but also a hundred other business associations working with us all for a common cause of sharing information, ensuring that, that we're able to get information from government to put out to our members, but also that government is able to, to hear the voices of, of business. And the other thing I'll say, Lauren, as a former cabinet minister, is that one of the toughest things is, is that there are so many disparate voices there, including for, for business. And when you get 45 different groups all coming to you, arguing for something different, uh, it makes it very difficult. You're called upon to cut every Gordian knot and to, to uh, mediate between competing groups. Role that the, the strength of chambers of commerce is their breadth. It's that they bring together people from a wide range of, of backgrounds and sectors and that they give one piece of advice. And it's that integrating function of, of bringing people around the table and saying, these are the half dozen key issues that need to be addressed. These are what the priorities have to be. Uh, that then serves as a, um, as a tool in a very positive way for, for government because it helps to make the job of, of, of decision making and of, of governing much easier. So that's, that's how it's functioned. Karen, great, uh, great introduction. And I think part of, you know, sort of the role that we find as chambers, uh, and I'm sure you guys are finding, and I know we do at Manitoba and Winnipeg, is that as a number of these different programs, whether it be provincially or federally, are being rolled out, and the number of times that they're changing as well, uh, what we find is that what businesses are really looking for is information and clarity on these programs. And I'm, I'm curious in terms of, uh, is that a, one of the main reasons why uh, the Canadian Chamber took the leadership role to establish something like the Canada Business Resilience Network was to be sort of that conduit for information in terms of what the business community is looking for and, and what kind of things and how more can business help out in regards to this would be the question I would ask you. Karen. Chuck was absolutely critical. Uh, first of all, government government's suffering from a bandwidth problem right now. There's so many decisions and the landscape is changing so rapidly that it's very hard for governments at any level to keep up with, with the decisions they have to make. And there are so many stakeholders who are involved here that their capacity to be able to reach out to each one individually is limited. Uh, it means then that by bringing people around the table, we are able to assist government in terms of getting factual information to to uh, businesses and others, but also in terms of soliciting information uh, about what the impacts are. Did the wage subsidy program cover what was needed? Uh, uh, what about the, you know, what about other elements in terms of, in terms of assistance to workers and so on? So uh, that is absolutely critical. Um, information is the key currency here at this, at, at this point. We need to know what's working and what isn't. Uh, we need to know what sort of changes can be made to be able to make improvements on programs. Governments genuinely are looking. They're not, they're not seeking ways to exclude businesses or to shut them out, but their businesses still falling through cracks. And the other thing, the other thing that, that 
that Trevin would underscore as well is that largely the architecture of the programs is largely there. Uh, you know, we know what the white wage subsidy program is. We know generally what what the uh, what the rent subsidy program is, and so on. There will still be more programs tailored for, to specific sectors, and we'll we'll see that. And they will be doing some fine tuning. Uh, and there and there are still companies falling into cracks that that aren't covered today, and uh, they'll be making changes there. But the most important thing at this point is execution. Now, Trevin was mentioning earlier the, the issue of, of uh, the solvency of so many businesses across the country. We are going to be coming out of this having lost tens of thousands of businesses, tragically. And it means then that workers won't have, uh, won't have businesses to go back to. Their employer is gone. It means that governments will lose the tax revenue that would have come from those businesses. And uh, what we saw even, even before doing the survey was that particularly small and medium-sized businesses, which are 98% of the businesses in Canada, simply don't have the resources, the, the cash in the bank that they can continue to run without, uh, without money coming in. And that's why our focus has been very much on, on what could we do to encourage the government to get money into the hands of the people who need it as rapidly as possible because money that comes too late is worth nothing. If, if the company is closed, uh, then the subsidy is, is meaningless. And uh, the, the message we've been consistently giving is that, that the, the urgency here, time is of the essence, and uh, that what we're looking at is something of a scale and a force and a size uh, that dwarfs anything we've ever seen before. Thank you very much, Perrin. Um, my question is uh, for Trevin. Uh, of course, in your role as chief economist, you're constantly monitoring key economic indicators and forecasts from various financial institutions and agencies. And I know you've touched on it in your opening remarks, but I'm hoping if you can kind of give us a, a high level view of where Canada's economy was pre-COVID. You've touched on obviously what the impact has been uh, right now, but maybe even a little bit based on what you've heard from that survey, what are your thoughts on where we're going to go? Where is the Canadian economy? $250 billion potential deficit. Um, I'm asking you to look into your crystal ball a little bit and tell us what the economic landscape looks like. Yeah, so I'll start with the, uh, the pre-crisis period. And I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's all relative because there, there's a huge hit that, that's happening right now. Um, but it's not, the economy wasn't gangbusters before the crisis um, either. And, and we should keep, you know, we, we, we basically, you know, limped in, into the crisis itself. Um, last year, our economic growth wasn't, um, you know, it was around 1.5, 1.6% GDP growth in, in 2019, um, but it really tapered off in, in the fourth quarter of last year as well. Um, and then in January, we saw 0.1% um, GDP growth. Um, in February, the numbers just came out this morning, uh, there, there was no economic growth in February. A lot of that is, is due to, it seems like a while ago now, um, but, but the rail blockades that, that took place in February had, had a pretty big economic hit uh, even before that going into the crisis as well. Um, you know, usually um, Statistics Canada, for instance, takes quite a bit of time before coming up with, with the GDP data. Um, and so the official GDP numbers for March are and Q1 are not going to be available till the end of May. Um, but they did a, a flash survey um, for March this year. Um, and so, uh, you know, based on that flash survey, the economy declined 9% uh, in March. Um, obviously, we yeah. Yeah, it was it was uh, it was quite large. You know, this this was the 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 largest GDP monthly GDP decrease um, on record at least since they started using that methodology in the 1960s. Um, you know, there are a, a million people uh, unemployed, also the largest uh, decline in, in the labor force um, since they started uh, tracking it with the same methodologies in the 1970s. Um, you know, th this is obviously a, a historic crisis. Um, I did mention over the next quarter um, what the Bank of Canada is looking at. Um, so about a 15 to 30 percent decline in GDP over Q2. Um, and sorry, that's a decline from from Q4 last year. Uh, so 15 to 30 percent decline since then. Um, 
Looking forward for the rest of the year, um, I, I always make the caveat that this is very uncertain um, economic projections during this time period. Um, it's a very fluid situation and a lot of it is going to depend on the decisions of policymakers and how Canadians react to it. Um, but the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, did, um, did a projection for, for Canada for the year um, and we're looking at around a 6.2% decline in GDP this year, uh, you know, over last year. Um, which is which is quite significant, obviously. Um, but then, hopefully, we're looking at a rebound in in 2021, um, as most countries are. Um, you know, at least according to the current projections, or around a four percent bump. Um, you know, not making up the, the entire decline, or not even close to it, really. Um, but but at least looking looking at growth, um, hopefully into 2021. Um, you know, the good news is um, some to somewhat good news is that the you know second quarter is supposed to be very bad, that the worst. Um, third quarter, fourth quarter, uh, you know, the, the decline is supposed to be less. Um, and so that, you know, hopefully uh, we're, we're able to enter a period of, of recovery at that point. Trevin, maybe as a bit of a follow-up, I'm just, I'm curious when you're, when you saw the survey results and in terms of kind of looking forward, are there some key sectors that we really need to focus on as we come out of recovery? And again, even to the point, are there some other key sectors? And I'm thinking specifically when it comes to tourism, uh, that are going to take a lot longer to recover than others? And, and what kind of supports might those industries need to be able to get them back to, I, I guess, sort of a, a new sense of normal? Yeah, and I can tell you um, from that survey, the hardest hit sectors um, were, you know, they, they, StatsCan doesn't have a separate section for, for tourism. But if we look at things like accommodation, uh, you know, that that's one of the sectors that's taking the biggest hit hotels. Um, if we look at uh, restaurants, that's one of the sectors that's taking the biggest hit. Um, if we look at retail, um, that, that's one of the sectors that's taking the biggest hit as well. Um, and if we look at uh, oil and gas energy, na natural resources uh, writ large, but specifically oil and gas because of um, the, the drop in demand and, and what's happening with oil prices, um, th that's another very big one. Um, and you'll keep in mind, with the exceptional oil and gas, um, most uh, when it comes to retail, when it comes to accommodation, um, when it comes to restaurants, um, a lot of these are small businesses too. Uh, right there, you know, they're they're almost first on on the chopping block when it comes to the hit that, that's happening right now, um, and so. Um, what, what's interesting, and I, I, I know that uh, the Premier of Manitoba certainly mentioned about, you know, restaurants being being reopened, I think it's on Monday, right, um, and, and bars. And so uh, what we're seeing in a lot of those small businesses in those particular sectors um, is a drop in demand. Um, you know, it's people are at home and they're not going to restaurants, nor, nor can they necessarily, except for through deliveries and things like that. Um, and hopefully that drop in demand, that huge drop in demand that we've seen, that we're able to recover from that more quickly um, once economies start to reopen, because hopefully that demand will come back organically, at least if people feel safe in public places and feel safe, you know, going back to businesses and things like that. Um, over the medium or longer term, um, there are those industries that um, have been hit by by declines in, in the, by disruptions to the supply chain. Um, you know, uh, things like manufacturing. Um, you know, like agriculture has had a huge hit to supply chains. Not not a huge hit to demand, but but to supply chains. Um, and so, be, if we have a number of different provinces um, with different paces of opening up and different rules, um, then that might disrupt supply chains for particular industries over the medium term or longer term. Uh, and so, you know, to have at least aligned guidelines when it comes to that will certainly help with recovery. Chuck, I wonder whether I might just add to that as, as Absolutely, well. Perrin. Usually, when you look at recessions, at global recessions, usually the country that's first in is the country that's first out. When you look at it with how this has hit uh, in terms of industries, it is not the industry that is first in that will be the industry first out. Trevin was mentioning, for example, hospitality, tourism, hotels, restaurants, and so on. Uh, they were among the very first hit, and they're going to be feeling it for a longer period of time than other yeah. sectors are as well. They're not going to bounce back. And if you look particularly at the restaurant sector, for example, uh, if we still have social distancing uh, measures in, in place, which one expects there's going to be in most jurisdictions, and you take, at the best of times, uh, restaurants are a low margin business, and a large percentage of them go out of business within the first three years of, of being open. Uh, you take half the seats out of a restaurant, and it's very hard then to see what the business plan is that, that enables the, the restaurateur to, to manage. So there are going to be sectors that, that even after the government restarts the economy, 
uh, that are going to require uh, specialized attention. And that's going to be absolutely critical. Uh, the other point I think that I would make is that uh, we use terminology like I just did about restarting the economy or reopening the economy. And the implication is that it's like a car that we're going to decide we're going to get out our, our key, put it in the ignition, turn it, and the, the engine will start. Right. Not going to happen that way. We've, we've damaged the engine badly. Uh, many of the, we've lost several cylinders in the engine. And it means then that, that we will be starting on a staggered basis to begin with, bit by bit, region by region, sector by sector. And uh, beyond that, 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 uh, that there's been structural damage that's been done. It, it may be more appropriate for us to talk about rebuilding the economy than restarting the economy and uh, having a very focused view of that. And, and we certainly need to look at what sectors in particular are going to need continuing assistance. Um, you know, Perrin, you, you mentioned uh, an automobile, and uh, I think that's a good analogy for leading into my next question, is, is really about North American supply chain, North American trading. Uh, of course, Canada, United States have just completed the new NAFTA or CUMSA or whatever acronym you choose to use. Uh, how do you see trading relationships, supply chains, and the integrated North American economy evolving in a post-COVID world? Are we looking at significant repatriation of overseas manufacturing and a transformation of global trade into global trading blocks? Is Canada, sorry, I know these are a lot of questions, but is Canada at risk of a doubling down on the Buy America? Um, the answer is, as long as Mr. Trump is there, we're at risk of uh, doubling down on Buy America with or without COVID-19. But there are a number of lessons that, we, that we've learned about this. The first is that supply chains are working remarkably well under the circumstances. Uh, they, the whole of the global economy has taken an incredible hit. And this is you know, it's disease that is, that is doing this. It's not simply political considerations. Um, but in talking to uh, grocery, grocery store chains and to restaurants and so on, they're telling me that for the most part that the supply chains are working well and they're able to get, to get the products that they, they need. They are worried, as Trevin was mentioning, agriculture is under pressure. Uh, people are worried today about, the, about what happens with this season's crops in Canada. Are farmers going to be able to get them into the fields and will they be able to get them off and, and get them... Uh, uh, into into the food chain successfully, uh, into the supply chain. Um, what there are a lot of lessons that we've learned from this. Um, the first is that that uh, because we've become so globalized in our supply chains, and uh, we've gone to the lowest cost supplier, and because supply chains have historically worked so well that they were like the electricity in our in our walls that you assume you throw the switch, it's going to flow no problem. Now, uh, suddenly, when we found the shutdown of the Chinese economy, we've, people who were looking for inputs from China or people looking to sell to China suddenly found that that uh, economy had been put into an induced coma. Um, and, and this was a very serious problem. Where people had gone with one cheapest supplier, and that was Chinese, suddenly we were seeing significant shortages of, of goods that couldn't feed into these supply chains. Secondly, what we've seen is uh, the growth of pandemic protectionism, and as particularly as we're looking at medical equipment and supplies, over 75 countries have brought in export res restrictions on, uh, on medical equipment and supplies, and they've said, we won't allow you to ship this equipment out of our, out of our country. Um, an example is, of course, the United States, where President Trump were, used, used Korean War legislation to say that, that, uh, that N95 respirators couldn't be shipped to Canada. We were able, ultimately, to resolve that. But, uh, but if even your closest trading partner, your closest ally, your, your, your neighbor, is prepared to say, forget it, Canada, you're on your, your own, it indicates the vulnerability that we have. Now, so the irony here, Lauren, is... is is twofold. The, the, the first is the lesson we should be learning from a global pandemic is that global problems require global solutions. Now, uh, you can't stop the pandemic simply at Canada's borders if, if there isn't a solution found outside of our borders. And it requires global collaboration. And yet, through this, it's encouraged countries to be more nationalist and more local and to put up borders 
and, and restrictions uh, that weren't there before. You see President Trump, for example, pulling back funding from the World Health Organization at a time when we need to look for, for global solutions. So uh, we will see an attack, I believe, on globalization. Uh, it will also require that countries like Canada will still, well, we should still be resolutely internationalist. Uh, we need also to look at what our needs are. If we can't count on other countries to supply us when we most need those supplies, then we have to ask ourselves, how do we protect ourselves? There are two or three ways of doing it. The first is you can stockpile in Canada and uh, pay to, to build inventories that you hope you're never going to have to use what you've got as a, as a buffer. The second is that, that instead of having too many eggs in one national ba basket, that you uh, go to a number of different suppliers in different countries so that if one shuts down, you may be able to go to another. That, again, adds cost to you to not simply be going to the, to the lowest bidder. The third is that you nearshore or bring your production right to Canada. And we have built in Canada a, uh, uh, a Canadian uh, uh, public health industrial base now, similar to the defense industrial base that we have. Um, my guess is uh, Canada Goose probably isn't going to want to be in the, in the medical mask business permanently. They'll want to go back to, uh, to, to jackets and the like. Although, if they put the logo on it, this could be a fashion accessory that people around the world would be, would be looking for. Um, but we have built uh, very quickly now, this base in Canada, we need to look at what do we need to maintain here and how do we do that to ensure that in times of crisis, whether it's, whether it's another pandemic, which is much more virulent than this one, whether it's a climate change emergency, a, national, a natural disaster, cyber terrorism, uh, economic collapse, what is it that we need to, to have near home to ensure that we protect the, the security of Canadians? So all of that is in, is in, uh, in question. I would hope that as it looks at North America, with us now having, um, having the COSMA, the successor to, to NAFTA, that the approach of all three countries would be, let's keep our borders open, let's look at how we work together. But what we've learned in this crisis is that even with these agreements, we can't count on our closest neighbor to be there when we need them. Thank you, Chuck. I don't know if you're going to jump to the Q and A part now. Maybe. Take yeah, some. I was going to jump. We've got some some Q and As, and if people uh, want to ask some questions, I think they can do that as well. So, and maybe this question is for Perrin as well. And and again, uh, it comes from Tim Schmidt, and I know Tim's with the uh, the Steinbeck Chamber of Commerce, and he asked the question about people really basing their decision making on the actions of the information coming from government, and asked the question: Is government being asked to make sure their messaging is being considered? as an important part of restarting the economy. And I think that really goes to rebuilding consumer confidence. Uh, and we're seeing that, you know, right here in Manitoba, obviously, in terms of, uh, you know, the announcement yesterday by the Premier that things are going to uh, reopen as of Monday. Uh, but there's still a lot of, uh, you know, apprehension, obviously, within uh, the business community, with some businesses not potentially being uh, prepared to open by Monday, and even more so with consumers. Uh, because I think you've mentioned this as well, is it's, it's, it's one thing to open, but you also need to get that, uh, you know, that confidence, not only with employees, but with consumers going forward. So does government have a real role to, in, to play in that? Or is that, you know, or does that need to be something more in concert with the business community? Because that's something that obviously Lauren and I are, are, are very strong advocates for here in Manitoba and you at the Canadian level, but really in terms of rebuilding consumer confidence, because this isn't something we've really had to take to this level before. Um, confidence is, is the key consideration. Government has to lead on that. And, and uh, Chuck, in this instance, normally when we talk about confidence, we talk about confidence in the economy, confidence of investors, and so on. In this instance, the most important element of confidence is safety. Before anyone is going to come out of their home and go into a store, they're going to want to know that they're not putting their lives and the, the lives of their, of, of, of their families in jeopardy. The same applies for our employees. As we reopen our businesses, our employees are going to want to know that, that they're going to be safe and coming back into, uh, onto the work site. And so government has a key role to, to, to play there, working with business. Um, at the end of the day, government is the arbiter of this. It's, it's government and the public health authorities that decide when it's safe to open up. They need to look at it with, in conjunction with business, 
So first of all, that, that, that business can advise as to what is doable and what isn't. For, for example, one of the problems we have today when I talk to national retailers is they say that it comes right down to the level of local medical officer of health. And they may set different standards for who can come into a store in one municipality from what you get in another one or in another province. And they say, when we plan, we want to, we want to have supplies uh, for all of our stores across the country. And we want to have standard protocols that we're using for what it is the stores have to do to protect the safety of their, of their customers, their employees. So we need coherence in, in what we're doing. We need to work together on that. The other point I would make uh, that, that I had meant to make earlier, Chuck, is uh, I'm very concerned because uh, with SMEs pre precisely on this level of confidence. Uh, what we are looking at, uh, I've been doing some reading, looking at what's happened in China as they've reopened, what's happening in, in uh, Germany as well as they're doing it. Uh, we are not finding in those countries the return to retail that there was before. Uh, people are, are staying back and they're staying back uh, according to the pieces I've been reading for two reasons. The, f the first is, uh, has the disease been fully contained? Am I at risk if I go into a store? My consumer patterns have changed when I'm going to the grocery store once a week instead of regularly going out. And the second is obviously financial insecurity still. Um, people are, are worried about where will I be at this time next year? Can I afford to make that purchase or do I stay back? So. Now, uh, building confidence is going to be absolutely critical. It requires both business and, uh, and uh, governments to work together. Thank you, Perrin. Uh, my, my question, uh, I'm going to merge a few things here. Uh, first part is to Trevin and then uh, to, to Perrin. But Trevin, uh, you have your doctorate. Uh, you've taught at some of the most prestigious schools worldwide. Uh, you've taught, lived, and breathed economics. Uh, will this pandemic and its impact on our economy change our modern understanding of economic theory and how we view government's role in the economy is, is Keynesian economics dead? Um, and, uh, you know, as it relates to recovery. Um, and then I'm again, glad by putting this, I'm glad you're putting this to Trevin as opposed to me with my past it, well, social sciences BA, uh, Lauren. Um, and the extension to you, Perrin, would be um, you know, Manitoba has uh, the largest Indigenous population in the country on a per capita basis. Um, be interested in your thoughts as to uh, the conversations you're having with the federal government that uh, where is reconciliation within the recovery plan. But first part to Trevin there. Yeah, I just, um, so, so a few things I would mention. Um, this is not an economic crisis or downturn. Uh, like any other. Um, this is not uh, 2008 uh, and it's not 1929. Um, it's not the usual boom bust cycle not the, that, that we often see when it comes to economic downturns, right? Um, there wasn't a building up of asset bubbles that suddenly burst. Um, this is an, an external catalyst through a health pandemic, um, you know, that Governor Polas has likened to, to a natural disaster or, or Perrin mentioned, you know, a cybersecurity threat um, that created the catalyst for a downturn. So, so it's different in that way. Um, whether it will change our complete understanding of economics, I, um, I'm certainly a student of economic history as well. Um, and so I look at, um, at how these crises tend to, to change these things. Um, you know, I think a lot of what we're seeing right now is very much Keynesian. Um, it's engaging in countercyclical spending, you know, this quarter of a trillion dollar deficit um, is that the question will be uh, what happens after the emergency measures? Um, you know, do they, do they themselves taper off um, and we transition to pro-growth policies um, that, that are good for our economy and, and good for recovery and good for getting businesses back on track? Um, or is there going to be larger government intervention that's more of a longer term trend um, in the economy? Um, certainly in, within Ottawa policy circles um, and in the media these days too, um, you know, we've heard some of these proposals, whether they are for New Deals or Green New Deals or, um, you know, uh, policies that um, are a bit more protectionist or a bit more nationalist um, to, to protect certain industries. Um, that doesn't necessarily change our understanding of economics. Um, it might take us back a few decades to, to where Canada used to be, but before we instituted some policies, um, that, and that might have created some challenges for economic growth and, and competitiveness for many of our businesses. Um, but 
you know, the, the fundamentals, at least in terms of understanding what's going on, uh, still apply. One of the interesting issues I think we're seeing is um, not that we're transitioning. I hate the, the false dichotomy of an old economy and a new economy. Um, but, uh, you know, when we're seeing this move towards e-commerce um, and, and things like that, um, are there um, new technological, digital innovation aspects of businesses um, that many have adapted to and, and adopted during the crisis that are here to stay for the longer term? Also, as consumers get more used to, to consuming in that way as well. Um, and so that, that's an interesting question. You know, we saw this um, in, in, in the Great Depression, for instance, you know, a shift from an agricultural economy to an industrial economy. Um, and is this something similar uh, that, that we're looking at too? That, that's an interesting question. I know we've only got a couple of minutes left, so maybe I'll ask one final question before Lauren wraps it up. And, and I'll ask the question of Perrin. Perrin, I think, um, you know, I, and, and, and Trevin talked a little bit about this, about the old economy and the new economy. And I would suggest that, you know, and the impact this has had on the chamber network uh, on, on the COVID-19 at the, you know, the, the traditional chamber network and the, uh, and what's emerging as a chamber network. So I'd be interested in your kind of, and we've seen it here in Manitoba, um, you know, the amount of engagement that I can tell you that we're having throughout the chamber network as a result of this has been, uh, unbelievable. And I'm, I'm curious as to what you see as the future for the chamber network in, in Canada, uh, as a result of, of what we've had to go through with COVID-19. I'll be glad to respond to that, Chuck. But let me also respond to Lauren's question earlier about, about Indigenous reconciliation. No backtracking on that. It is absolutely critical to us. It's part of the key to resolving some of the issues that we have in Canada. Uh, is absolutely critical to our competitiveness as a, as a nation. And uh, we'll be arguing for a change in the government's agenda in a, in a number of areas, but not as it relates to uh, Indigenous reconciliation. We, we must succeed in that with, in, in Canada. And uh, one of the things we've learned from, from this, and it applies to your question as, as well, Chuck, is we're stronger together when we work together and when we're, we're one country. And uh, what the Chamber Network has, has seen is the strength that comes when all of us are working together. Uh, chambers of commerce across the, the country are hurting because their members are hurting. And uh, if Main Street has gone dark, that means that, that people don't have the capacity to support their, their chamber that they had previously. And uh, that means that, that it's critical for us to, to work together. So the Canadian Chamber is absolutely determined in anything that we do to ensure that, that, that we use our voice and our resources to try to assist. That was one of the reasons why we argued that nonprofits should be eligible for the wage subsidy. And it's why we wanted to put resources available through the CBRN to support uh, all of, the, all of the, the network and to do so free. Uh, and we're going to continue to do that. The other thing, though, is we're changing the way in which we're doing business as well. What we're doing right now is an example of that. And... Uh, in many ways, we're not going to go back at the Canadian Chamber. We have done more outreach in terms of using uh, digital technologies to go into communities that you just physically often don't have the time to do and to have these conversations. And uh, we're going to continue to do more of this in the future, uh, not less, and to use these technologies to tie us together and to make the whole of this network stronger. Well, I know we could uh, keep going for quite a while, so I want to move to our, our closing comments. Uh, I'll, I'll ask um, Perrin and Trevin for some closing comments and then turn it over to Jessica to close the meeting. But I, I will say this, uh, thank you to Chuck for partnering with us again. Uh, thank you, Perrin and Trevin, for the tremendous work that you're doing. Uh, um, you know, I've been involved with the Chamber movement since uh, the 1990s. And, uh, you know, Jessica's comments about this may be the, the Canadian Chamber's finest, finest hour, um, I, I think is spot on. And the leadership that you've shown through this crisis, uh, I know you've been working 24-7 and uh, we'll get through this. And a big part of why we'll get through this is because of your leadership, your insight and the advice that you're giving to government and your receptiveness to hearing the voice of all corners of this country, the small businesses, the large international companies and everyone in between. So uh, as, as a proud Canadian Chamber member, thank you very much for all that you do. And I'll turn it over to Perrin and Trevin and then uh, ask Jessica to conclude. 
Well, Lauren, let me simply reciprocate and say how grateful we are at the Canadian Chamber level to our Chamber network across the country and the businesses that continue to, to support them. Uh, I've never been more proud of this network and I've never been more grateful for the support that we've had from you and our colleagues across, uh, across the country. Um, as, as I guess we've conveyed, these are tough times. We don't have to tell anybody that. And uh, they're going to continue to be tough times for some while yet. But the one thing that we do know is that we're stronger together. And what one thing that we are determined at, uh, about at the federal level, at the, at the Canadian Chamber level, is that we will be there to assist in any way that we can. Uh, you, through your strength in being representing Main Street Canada, give us our strength. And anything we can do to backstop you and help you uh, will be there. So thank you to everybody who's been on the call and thank you in, in particular for your collaboration, which is just tremendous. We're very proud to be partners. Thank you. Kevin? Uh, I mean, I, I, I would just echo what, what Perrin said as well, is that, um, you know, it's, it's first of all an honor to, to receive invitations like this to talk to uh, Chambers of Commerce, local and provincial, but, but also, uh, you know, businesses and, and hearing from them on the ground and the questions that they have and doing whatever we can to help. Um, it really reminds us at the Canadian Chamber um, who we're doing this for and, and you know, what, what type of impact we can have, you know, for individual businesses and, and individual Canadians. Um, and so, you know, we, parents, right, it's, it's, it's going to continue to be tough. Um, and we are there to do whatever we can to, to help businesses to advocate on their behalf. Um, and so um, if there is any way that, that we can serve you better in terms of policy ideas, in terms of programming ideas, um, in terms of the Canadian Business Resilience Network, uh, please, please don't hesitate to reach out to us or your local and provincial chambers of commerce. Thank you, Trevin. And again, that's www.cbrn.ca. Again, all the survey information is there. It's your one-stop shop for information on federal programming, all that the Chamber Network's doing. Um, so please make sure you check it out. Final word to our Chair, Jessica Dumas. Thank you very much. I really appreciate this conversation between the three levels of the Chamber movement, working closely together and supporting our business and our economy. And I love to hear we work, we are stronger together. I truly believe that this was very insightful and uh, I'm sure our members and our listeners also feel the same way. Thank you very much to the Winnipeg Chamber team, to the Manitoba Chamber team and to Perrin Beatty as well as uh, Trevin Stratton. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Um, and thank you to everyone else who joined us. Please remember to check out our website at winnipeg-chamber.com for COVID-19 business support links, as well as um, a recently uploaded uh, video channel of some of our online conversations and also more ways to connect. So thank you to each of you and uh, please enjoy the rest of your day.